Thank you very much, Link, and, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of my my own stories. Uh, I, I'm going to share them not because I think my stories are important, but because I think that they, um, to some extent, illustrate uh, journeys that many non-Aboriginal uh, colleagues who uh, eventually become engaged, who eventually, on their own personal level, make a decision that they don't want to be idle uh, if, they, if they can uh, engage. Uh, I think there are some aspects of these experiences that might resonate and perhaps may help us reflect on how to capitalize on the potential of some of these conditions to, um, to mobilize uh, colleagues towards uh, activities that can be, be helpful to the, the greater uh, cause. Before I go, go on, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very privileged to speak here on the Musqueam territory. Uh, and I want to make that point because it took me uh, actually more than a year after I arrived at UBC to even know that I was on the Musqueam territory. So, so to, to go from, from that to the point of, of uh, beginning to, to understand the uh, importance of, uh, uh, of acknowledging that, that we are here on the Musqueam territory, I think uh, starts to illustrate the transformation that has to occur at an individual level in order to consider one's contribution to uh, advancing some of, of these issues. Um, as Link has, uh, has mentioned, uh, I am a first generation immigrant. Uh, I, I grew up in Poland, uh, came to UBC uh, in my, uh, well I was just 30 years old, uh, and uh, uh, and at that point in time, probably about a week after I arrived in Canada, in Vancouver at UBC, uh, I started teaching. And one of my courses uh, was an art education methods class for NITEP students. Uh, I can't imagine anyone being less prepared to teach this class than I was. Uh, and I, I remember finding myself uh, with a group of students uh, and realizing within the first half an hour of, of our engagement that I completely don't fit in this context and that my ability to, uh, to do what the students needed me to do was extremely restricted. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there was this realization that I really didn't know what to do to make myself relevant. Uh, so, and I think this, this experience of uh, of realizing how one doesn't fit uh, very much resonates with what was just uh, said at the end of the last session in your comments, that um, non-Aboriginal uh, faculty, non-Aboriginal colleagues often really struggle uh, with, uh, with their fit within the context uh, and, and need support, need help, need advice, need guidance, need, need direction uh, in order to be able to do what they can do, but only if, if, they, are, if they are helped. Which will take me <coughs> to this theme of partnership and collaboration uh, uh, that, that, you know, I am very convinced that uh, my ability and ability of other uh, uh, colleagues in academia and those who are academic administrators is tremendously restricted and limited unless and until we can draw on meaningful partnerships and, and guidance and direction and, and mentoring, if you will, uh, from those who do really understand and internalize uh, Aboriginal history and Aboriginal reality of today in much more direct and intimate ways than, than uh, we ever can. So what I wanted to, to comment, and I, I'll, I'll try to move into some specific examples of, of initiatives, but I wanted to put them perhaps within what I see as some of, of if you will, uh, almost necessary conditions for non-Aboriginal uh, faculty or non-Aboriginal administrators in, in the university to to have the potential, or have the, the potential capacity to contribute to 
the, the, the movement. And I'm, I'm trying to use these words carefully because, uh, you know, I would not want to come across as someone arrogant enough to say that, you know, here we are to make a difference. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is that, you know, when, when we reach that point of understanding that, that there is a need to be idle no more, uh, I think there is also this realization that, at least it has been for me, that on my own in isolation, I'm extremely limited in being able to contribute. And, and I need to find ways to, to partner, to gain not only legitimacy for my action, but most of all the, the wisdom, the direction, and the guidance that can help me in my, in my steps. It, what I think makes it particularly difficult for non-Aboriginal administrators and faculty to get engaged is precisely this position of an outsider. It's a position of an outsider which limits you not only because, because you lack that, that knowledge, but you also lack that emotive and lived and, and, and sort of you know, bodily experience with the issues in which, in which Aboriginal people have lived the history and in which they are living the, uh, the contemporary reality. You know, I can look at this reality and I can look at this history uh, through, through the prism of my own attempt to understand, uh, to, uh, to, to comprehend, uh, and to potentially respond to through a positive action. But I, uh, I will never claim that I can really have the level of understanding uh, and, and the, the depth of engagement, if you will, uh, that those who have lived through this, this history and, and, and who, who actually live this, this, this uh, condition now uh, do, do experience. Now, what makes this position as an outsider, and here I'm going to, to comment not just on my experience, but, but what I've heard and what I experience as I work or try to engage with others within the academia who are non-Aboriginal about indigenous and Aboriginal issues. What makes this, this positioning sometimes almost disabling uh, or, or, or um, or putting one in a, in a position to excuse themselves from being idle no more, is, is the way in which the history and the current condition put non-Aboriginal people uh, very readily in a position of a guilt. And I want to speak about this very openly because I have in my own, uh, you know, living of, 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 of my engagement with Aboriginal issues, have had to come to terms with very strong uh, feelings, emotions, and, and intellectual processes around this concept of, of guilt. Uh, you know, it, it's impossible for a non-Aboriginal person to attend a session of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and not share in that sense of guilt. At the same time, uh, you know, and I think many of us in different uh, circumstances in life, I think recognize that that's not the most empowering position for a positive engagement. Because on the one hand, it can corner you into a very narrow space from which it's really very hard to positively and actively engage. But worse than that, it provides um, almost, uh, you know, it can provide an, an excuse uh, for non-engagement by trying to deflect it. And, and that's particularly uh, uh, problematic and I think dangerous for people who, you know, who like me are first generation immigrants, who really, quite frankly, had not much to do with all of the past of the Canadian history. You know, we, we are coming here, we are newcomers, we inherit something in which we personally or our ancestors have not played a part. This should not be seen as an excuse for us 
not to respond to this. But as one tries to deflect the sense of guilt, no one likes to feel guilty. That's a tempting possibility of getting yourself out of the equation. The other piece with the, uh, you know, as, as I, I've reflected, as I, as I talked to other non-Aboriginal people, particularly those who come from other minority groups, which have experienced racism, discrimination, um, you know, and, and, and other forms of, of injustice within the contemporary society, uh, it can put those groups very readily on a position to say, well, Aboriginal issues are not at all any different than ours. And I remember that kind of positioning and discourse quite prominently in the 1990s when there was a significant interest in multiculturalism. Uh, and as I was trying to learn about, you know, multiculturalism in Canada and the Aboriginal issues in Canada, many of my colleagues and some of my, you know, highly respected mentors were conflating the two, <laughs> the, the two issues. Were basically saying, well, Aboriginal issues are issues of multiculturalism in Canada. And it took quite a bit of time for me to actually be able to detangle them and to say, well, I, actually, that's, that's not what it is. Uh, you know, they, there are issues of, of other immigrants to Canada who might have struggled with some of, of the same approaches or attitudes that have been behind the injustices and the, the historical, uh, uh, you know, difficulties and, and unfairness that was bestowed on, on, on Aboriginal people. But that doesn't mean that the issues are the same. And I think hearing the, the, and, and, and being part of, of, of the um, Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, Commission sessions helped me understand it more vividly than I could have ever uh, understand it from books, from you know, talks, from, from lectures. That, that really was one of the most transformative experiences that, that, that I've had. Uh, in my life, in a sense, also as an, as an uh, academic administrator and, and as an academic. Um, so, so moving on maybe to, to some of the initiatives and to the strategic planning. Again, um, let me take a few steps back and, and, uh, uh, and say that when I returned to UBC in 2003 to my current position, this was just the time when the second track, or well, the track 2010 strategic plan was just about to be released. And, and as I came to the provost office in my, in my new role, I was told that First Nations House of Learning will report to my portfolio and that therefore I'll be somehow involved with this, uh, this uh, uh, problematics, which I, you know, I actually was tremendously uh, uh, happy that I will have an opportunity to, to be part of this conversation and this dialogue because of my experience with the, uh, in the Faculty of Education uh, uh, and particularly with NITEP students who, who really were the catalyst for me to, to become interested and wanting to be engaged and, and wanting to learn more and, and wanting to somehow contribute to the extent to which I could uh, to, to positive change. Uh, and literally, again, within the first few weeks of me being in the office, um, I remember having discussion or having a group of, of Aboriginal leaders within the university uh, coming in and saying, <coughs> well, where are Aboriginal priorities <laughs> in the strategic plan? And, and I started reading, I have not read before that track 2010, and indeed, you know, there, there, there was nothing there, and, and then after this sort of plea was, was, was being made for the university to somehow incorporate the, the um, Aboriginal issues into its strategic planning, there was really a kind of an afterthought paragraph uh, added to, to Track 2010. I mean, clearly not a satisfactory process, not a satisfactory engagement of the university with something that is so fundamentally important to this community, but also to Canada. So, 
So this experience, I think, helped me in my role in the provost office understand uh, what a tremendous task we have uh, moving forward. And again, to, uh, to, to realize for the second time in my career at UBC, how ill-prepared I am to really serve well in the role in which university has put me in with respect to Aboriginal issues. And what has uh, then become, you know, for me, a, a, a significant priority was to look for ways in which, given the role that I, uh, I had the privilege to, 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 to play with in the university, uh, I could find a form of partnership to be able to, to move along and to, to, to begin to, to hopefully, positively uh, uh, contribute. Now, this all, you know, really well coincided with many changes within the university, including the, the fact that, uh, you know, over a period of time, you know, we were able to uh, move with establishment of a position of senior advisor to the president, with the significant changes to the advisory board to the president, which now has involved many more um, uh, aboriginal uh, leaders from the communities, not just from the university, but from the outside of the communities. And... Uh, the the track 2010 sort of living its its uh, shelf life and the opportunity to create a, a new strategic plan at the time when President Tube uh, uh, expressed his commitment to to working in this area and 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 positioning the effort in a way where where we could start to think about the strategy for this university by developing an Aboriginal strategic plan. So from something that was an afterthought and, and, and a line added only because some people insisted at the end to turn it into a position and say, well, thinking about the, the, the plan for this university needs to begin with a strategic planning exercise that will address how this university needs to think and work towards making progress on, uh, on Aboriginal issues. And, uh, and you may recall that, that, that link uh, uh, at, at that time, it, there was really an interesting dialogue on how best to position this process. You know, is this the process that should be owned by the Aboriginal colleagues within the university? Is this the process that should be owned by the presidents and provost office? Uh, you know, where, where is the role for the administration, where there is the role for the community, uh, you know, and how to, what would be the strategy that would hopefully help us move, uh, you know, move, move in ways that would allow us to, to mark some tangible, small, uh, you know, gains. Uh, and in the end, the decision has been to move in a model that that is a partnership model, uh, where I think there was a recognition that the, in order for the strategy to, 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 to be developed, uh, Aboriginal uh, um, colleagues have to lead this process. That, that that's where the, 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 um, the, the process, uh, as well as the interpretation of the process, has to happen within that, that framework of, um, of understanding. But at the same time, I think there was, an, there, there was also a, a recognition that in order to move university structures and to move the, the, the organizational machine of the university, there will have to be uh, uh, someone at the kind of administrative table, you know, pushing their, the, the, the buttons that need to be pushed all along and, and helping build primarily the framework for accountability for some of the uh, goals uh, that, that will be put forward. So we've, we've started moving very much within this, uh, this, uh, this framework. And one other piece that I perhaps would like to, to say, you know, there was something very powerful that the previous, uh, that the, the, the uh, speakers who made the comments, last two comments at the closing session of the previous panel, have, have made, and one of them referred to you know that that we we try to 
to focus on, you know, we want the glamorous stories, but we don't want the stories, uh, you know, that, that, that really focus on the, uh, the, the reality, the, the, the pain, the experience. I think that this university, if we are to move forward, needs both. Uh, I think one of the reasons why, after attending this session at the North Shore, when we had a conversation with Link, you know, I, I, I felt very strongly that it would be important to bring to the university, here to campus, uh, an event of the same nature in the following year, and, and you know, and, 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 and Longhouse here hosted. Uh, uh, you know, another session the following year, and uh, was was precisely because of what what you've said that that without uh, recognition, without learning about uh, about the circumstances, it's very hard to engage in meaningful ways. But at the same time, I think I would argue that we need to to acknowledge. And, and have the moments of time where we can focus on the, on the positive steps, even if they are very small, because they give all of us uh, encouragement, I think, to, to move forward. And, and a sense of saying, well, it's being, being not idle, there is hope in it. You know, there is hope in it and there is perhaps some value in it. And, and I, I think that's important for people to to see this. You know, I can tell you that for me, one of the most um, most encouraging moments in, in, in the, the period of engagement with Aboriginal issues has been when last year we took to Senate the proposal to uh, suspend classes for a day so the university community, uh, students, faculty, staff, can attend the uh, final um, uh, West Coast event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in September, coming September. I have to tell you that I took several proposals to Senate on different issues where I was biting my nails and, and felt very insecure about which way it was going to go. Uh, this was the one where I had an absolutely sleepless night before. And, and the reason for that was that, in the same way as, as Link described, some of the processes that have led in the different place where he worked to articulate certain proposals, bring them to, to a forum. Discussions that led to this point sometimes had very difficult uh, uh, um, comments. Uh, a very, um, a, a very <laughs> problematic contribution. Uh, and, and one of the, my huge concerns was that, 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 that once, you know, I, to put it very bluntly, I, I was really worried what was going to be said at the floor of Senate. And, and having worked with Senate for, you know, eight years before, uh, I could clearly see how things could potentially go, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, in various ways. It was a, a remarkable experience to hear the Senate vote unanimously in favor of this notion, of this motion. And, and, I, and I think this, to me, this was a, a signal that this university, despite all that has to still happen, despite the, the fact that, that the issues of racism, that the issues of lack of understanding of history, that the issues of, uh, of curricular deficits, that the issues of lack of engagement of non-Aboriginal faculty are still huge issues that we need to tackle, that this university is beginning to move and is beginning to move in a direction that I think gives us hope that more people will be idle no more. Uh, uh, not in a sense of necessarily joining a particular movement, but doing what one of the survivors at the session that I attended, the first session in North Shore, uh, has called us to do. What this person has said is that they would like everyone 
to leave this event with one thing or, or one idea that you know what what an individual what 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 everyone would do on their personal level one thing to 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 try to respond to what they heard and what they saw that day uh, and I think this 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 approach uh, in tiny small increments but if, if everyone if, if, if every non aboriginal academic and scholar would would take this message and would act on it uh, I, I think you know a few years from now we would have many more people in this room and and more than that we would have more action uh, in the classrooms and, and, and within the academic community that would uh, that would support uh, the idle no more priorities.